Welcome back to Reading Bear. Today, we will take a look at some new Pori Ranch stories. And if you enjoyed my content, please don't forget to subscribe to my channel and post some bear emojis in the comments. Let's go! The first one is titled, I painted my pool green after my neighbor complained about my green pool. One of my neighbors complained about our green pool. It had been neglected for the winter and was looking a bit gross. I was actually in the middle of getting the chemicals sorted when an officer from the council turned up to do an inspection. I showed her all the chemicals and she was satisfied that I was getting it sorted. A week later, and she's back. Neighbors have complained again. It turned out the fiberglass in the pool was badly damaged and we've decided to rip it out and start again. Neighbor does not like the concrete pool. Council officer mentioned that the neighbor kept going on about how at least the concrete look was better than green. They apparently went on at length about how much they hated looking at a green pool. Green is my favorite color. The tradies doing our work also heard the neighbors complaining about our green pool. They showed me a color chart that lists emerald green as an available color. They'll give me a discount on that color if I want it. I've always wanted a green pool. We're going to start painting next week. The next one is titled, I finally stood up to my new squad leader and set off a cascade of revenge. I was working as an MP with great leadership when my squad leader, a SSG in charge of 12, got promoted to take over the entire platoon. I was private first class at the time and coming up on my own promotion. Sergeant Mike showed up. He had about nine, this is important, years in, which was average at the time and he was working to obtain the points needed to get the promotion to the next rank of SSG. My problems with him began when he would belittle and emasculate me to impress Genny. We worked patrol duty on a little base. Just three on each shift. A sergeant, and two soldiers. For several weeks I worked the same shift with Sergeant Mike and Private Genny. Genny was a friend and fellow squad member. Genny was her first name. I say Genny here because Mike really liked talking to Genny. So much so that despite her junior status Sergeant Mike called her Genny, and all of us males by rank, last name, or something derogatory. The informal rule was the junior patrol cleaned the MP station. This was thrown out when Genny worked. Sergeant Mike would belittle me and have me do it while he and Genny drank coffee and gossiped. This stung a bit because Genny and I were friends and I'd trained her when she arrived. She confessed that she felt bad for me and the other guys. She thought it was ducked up, but if all she had to do was flirt a bit to never clean she didn't see the harm. We had big inspection coming up. My former boss, the new platoon sergeant made it very clear to the lowest level soldier that any weapons not cleaned by the Friday before the inspection will be cleaned by the squad leaders alone the weekend before. Each squad had been given days assigned to clean, oddly Mike kept disappearing on our days. A week away from the inspection I was promoted to specialist. In rare circumstances with approval a specialist can serve as the patrol supervisor. Mike immediately tells me he's taking away my three-day pass and I'm to work his night shift in his place Friday night. He tells me to keep my mouth shut, embrace the opportunity and he will ensure everything is approved. So I do. I cancel my Friday night plans. Spend an extra amount of time pressing my uniform and shining my boots and show up Friday evening 15 minutes early. Genny and our other squad member Adam show up right on time. I'm excited to make the best of it. We spend 20 minutes signing for gear and receiving briefs. The desk sergeant gives me the keys for the arms room and we are about to make the five minute walk to draw weapons when Mike roars into the parking lot in his sporty car. He tells us there is no approval for me to work as the shift supervisor. He offers no apology or explanation. My weekend is ruined. My Friday night is ruined. It's almost 10 o'clock there is nothing to salvage. He begins screaming at me that some of my weapons are dirty. He says all of us are going to spend the entire night shift in the arms room cleaning weapons. He looks me in the eye as he snatches the keys from my hands and says, I know I was told I can't make you, but you're here now and you're gonna stay and ducking clean. He begins walking with Genny toward the arms room. I begin glumly walking behind with Adam. Mike is laughing with Genny how he ducked up my night. I hear him say again, yeah, that platoon sergeant said I couldn't make you guys clean on off days, but duck him. He'll keep his mouth shut. 
I stopped walking. I looked at Adam, sorry bro, duck this guy, and walked over to my car. Mike didn't notice until he heard my engine start. This was before cell phones. I spent the weekend at a girl's house off post. It felt good. My petty revenge. But it caused an avalanche after I left. The three of them, without my help, did spend the entire shift in the arms room. This upset the desk sergeant who told our platoon sergeant. It also upset Genny. She'd never had to clean so much. She couldn't flirt her way out either, it was too much work and Mike was desperate. When the platoon sergeant looked into why we weren't cleaning on the days assigned we said Mike was always sneaking away. Genny, with her unfamiliar calloused hands angrily offered up Mike was actually sneaking off to sleep with Genny's roommate, another private. Mike was demoted from sergeant to specialist. The retention control point for a specialist is 8 years. Mike had 9 years in service. Specialist Mike was chaptered out of the army. The next one is titled, Sapphire's Aunt A Karen's Best Friend. Not my story but my cousin's. Let's call him Dave. So Dave, 34, was dating a Karen for a really long time, like 4 years, and earlier this year he finally proposed. Now, Karen was a bit of a gold digger and a very entitled person. She was a bit of white trailer trash but fancied herself a rich lady. She was very vocal to all the other women in the family about how she wanted a traditional diamond ring and how she'd like Dave to follow the tradition of getting her an engagement ring worth three months salary. Now, Dave isn't super rich, but he does have a stable factory job and around here that's basically upper class. And his three month salary would be between $3,000 and $6,000 depending on overtime. Needless to say, Dave did not want to spend that on a ring given the global situation and the fact that he could be laid off at any time, he'd been doing the ring shopping at the beginning of the year and thankfully wasn't laid off. So Dave decided to look into alternatives and found white sapphires. For those of you who don't know, white sapphires are a fantastic alternative to diamonds. They're just as hard, can be grown so they're not gotten with slave labor, aren't artificially inflated in price, and to someone who isn't a jeweler they look exactly like any diamond. So, Dave was able to buy the size stone that Karen wanted with a fancy setting, gold band, the works for a fraction of the cost if it had been a diamond. He proposed, and told her it was a diamond and that he'd saved for a year. A bit of a dick move but it was him being petty. He told me it was probably his way of getting revenge for her being a Karen. However, it doesn't end there. As you can imagine, once the wedding planning started, it didn't go well. Karen was an entitled witch, and didn't understand why a global pandemic was cause enough to hinder her for having her perfect day. It all came to a head one day when she and Dave had a fight over the guest list. The dream venue she chose didn't allow for as many people as they needed, like 300, hey both have big families. And Karen sent out invitations, save the dates without Dave's knowledge. Except, she only invited her side of the family. No one on Dave's side got an invite, not even the in-laws. Dave called off the wedding and kicked her out of his apartment, in his name. Karen kept the ring out of spite, something Dave didn't really care about. It didn't hold any value to him and he was more worried about the wedding he was now having to cancel and the texts he was getting from Karen's side. It took a few months but they all calmed down and he didn't hear from her until last month. Turns out, she tried to pawn the ring to a pawn shop in town known for its jewelry because the owners were in the jewelry business before they switched to pawning. She was convinced that she's get a few thousand for it since she still believed it was a diamond. The pawn shop offered her a couple hundred because it was a sapphire and the owner actually liked it. She called Dave several times and sent a billion texts, he never answered or picked up, demanding that he pay her in cash what the ring was worth, threatening to sue for the lie he told her, etc. He and I had a good laugh listening to her tantrum. I guess diamonds might be a girl's best friend, but sapphires are definitely not for Karens. The next one is titled, You want to share all of my private information with friends and family? Hope you enjoy having no information at all. So here it goes. I met this girl in January of this year. We hit it off, and got along great. The mental, emotional, and physical chemistry was there, and everything seemed peachy. Fast forward a few months, and the true nature of her being comes out. She starts flipping out at me for hanging out with my other friends even once a week. She refused to allow me to have any time at all to myself. 
she starts saying very mean things about quite a lot of people, and to top it all off, she was a pill popper and alcoholic. Both things she lied about, because I've had trials and tribulations with those things in the past, and don't want to be around people like that. And she knew this. To top it all off, she was extremely rude to damn near everyone, and I was trapped because no one wanted to see her. But they wanted to see me, and I had to choose between her wrath for chilling with people, or sit there in agony as she gets ducked up and says terrible things about people I care about. I don't enjoy the company of people that are mean for no good reason like that at all, and I decided that it would much better for me to just be single, because I didn't want to run the risk of her negativity bleeding into me. Needless to say, she did not take that well. I had an account on her Mac that I used occasionally, and she knew the password. Here's where things get ducky. Since she knew the password on my account, the day after we split, she went on it and started sending very lewd messages and my nudes to everyone that was in my contacts. Including my mum and dad, those were very awkward conversations, believe me, because she had access to everything on my phone. I knew what she was doing, so I went into my account and booted her computer off it as soon as possible, because that is just not right. This was two weeks ago. About 30 minutes ago, I noticed more texts being sent on my behalf, and these are even worse than before. At this point, all my friends knew what kind of person she is, because they all know me well enough to know that I wouldn't do or say anything even close to what she was sending. I changed my password as well, but she had access to the app I used to manage my passwords, and used the new one to log back in. At this point, I am fuming. She is blatantly disregarding my privacy, and is just trying to ruin my relationships with everyone I care about. So I decide enough is enough. I went on find my iPhone, and located her Mac, because she signed back into my iCloud account. I noticed a button that says, Erase Mac. When I saw this, my heart flooded, because I finally saw a way to end the madness. Basically, I wiped the entire computer of all of its data, and also put a passcode on it, so that she can't even get back into her bricked computer, until she contacts me for it. Now she is stuck with a very expensive paperweight, and I can rest easy because she can no longer try to wreak havoc with my relationships, or have access to my private information and passwords. I have never done anything like this to someone, and I can't help but feel that I am going to get some form of karmic payback for it, but damn, does it feel good to finally get back at her for what she did, and then some. The next one is titled, Road Rage and a Petty Driver. Okay so I discovered recently I have terrible road rage, and mind you this is my first time driving on an interstate. But I was about maybe a half hour away from home after a long day and an hour on the road already so I was in the fast lane. So it started as I was getting ready to pass someone in the lane next to me when they decided to change lanes right in front of me without using their turn signal. Making me almost break check the person behind me. So I thought to myself, alright duck you dude, the dude in the lane you just left changed to the slow lane, so I'll just move to the middle lane. So I change lanes again and this guy does it to me again, so at this point I'm getting pretty upset cause I don't know what their deal was. I wasn't even sure if they had one, so I changed back into the fast lane to see if they would do it again, which they did. So I'm really ducking mad at this point so I decided to mess with them. I turned on my turn signal and acted like I was gonna change lanes again, but right when they changed into the lane I acted like I was going into I sped up past them real fast and did it to them a couple times. And boy were they throwing a fit and it was glorious but I wasnt done. I stayed close in front of them until we reached more traffic and then I drove the same speed beside the person next to me, trapping this person behind me and another car and I stayed that way till my exit came up. The next one is titled, I ruined your maple syrup, while I drank your vodka and then replaced it with water. I booked a bedroom on Airbnb, during my last vacation traveling alone in Europe. That was before this whole pandemic shenanigans. I planned on spending two nights in that city and the host told me I could join him and friends for drinks. As I didn't know anyone in that city I got excited about mingling with locals. Turned out he totally ghosted me for the whole night. I texted him and waited for hours to get a response. Nothing. After I end up wasting a good part of my night waiting I decided I finally I should just go out alone. By then I wasn't able to grab dinner anymore so I just went out for drinks. And, for my surprise I happened to bump into him and his friends at local the bar. What are the odds right? He awkwardly said hello and turned out to be a completely prick. Rude and arrogant. 
clearly talking about me to his friends in a language I didn't speak and laughing as well. I ended up distancing myself after looking like an idiot for a whole beer. And after I finished my drink, I decided heading back to his place. I felt so annoyed and humiliated with the situation, being the laughing stock of the night, I thought it was just fair if I messed around with him a bit. But how? I noticed there was a nice bottle of vodka and some fancy maple syrup brought from probably a trip to Canada and decided I should enjoy myself having a drink, made out of his vodka. And being a bit more petty, I added some vinegar his maple syrup. And after my nightcap, I replenished the vodka bottle with water. Just because. The next one is titled, Fire the IT Guy a Week Before My Wedding? Good luck without me. I worked for a small ISP, think two owners and six employees, in a college town years ago. This was before Wi-Fi was really much of a thing, but it wasn't a big deal because a lot of the apartment complexes we had contracts with had been wired, at our expense, with CAT5 Ethernet into each apartment. In some complexes where we hadn't deployed wiring to each unit, we tried to offer wireless service using original Cisco 802.118B access points. I had previously worked at a call center doing Win 9X tech support with Convergys on a contract with Microsoft, and during high school I had also been the network administrator for a small non-profit run by a friend of the family. I was hired to do phone tech support for the ISP based on my background, but when it was slow or they needed an extra pair of hands I was often co-opted into going out on service calls into the apartments of the students that were our customers, or into manual labor types of projects at the office like making Ethernet patch cables. I also worked most weeknights in an on-call basis in which support calls would be routed to my personal cell phone. But I only received a token amount of compensation since I wasn't working 100% of the hours that I was on call. But hey, it was a bit of extra income above the 40 hours at $9 per hour I was getting paid. One Friday I was using my lunch break to make some calls at my desk regarding a car accident I was in, and sorting things out with insurance, etc. Two of my co-workers were in the same area I was and we had all been making patch cables all ducking day. On Monday, one of the owners asked me into his office immediately after I arrived and informed me that I was being fired. This butthole knew I was getting married the following week, and took the opportunity to cut me loose before I could take advantage of any PTO for the wedding and my honeymoon. When I pressed him as to why he had made this decision, he indicated that the other owner saw me making phone calls and surfing the internet whilst my two other co-workers were making patch cables. I informed him that I was taking my lunch break by eating at my desk, and making phone calls on my personal cell phone, so I wouldn't use company equipment for non-work purposes. He didn't care, and gave me the boot anyway. One of the complexes we serviced was notorious for a very high incidence of Wi-Fi outages, as a significant portion of the units in it had not been wired yet. I was aware that my employer was in hot water with the complex management company for all the complaints coming from student tenants regarding the lack of reliability of their only option for broadband internet. I had been out to do a number of on-site service requests at this particular complex and I was very familiar with its network architecture and equipment locations. I remained friends with my former co-workers, and for weeks after my termination they continued to lament having to take support calls during the day, they were hired for blue-collar labor primarily. They also told me about all the angry customers leaving voicemails almost every night after hours while no one had replaced me to take after hours support calls, and that the two owners had the calls routed to their cell phones, but mainly ignored the calls or turned their phones off each evening. Maybe you can see where this is heading. At around 1am one night a few weeks after my termination, I drove into the parking garage section of our notoriously complainy complex, with 800 plus residents, ensured there were no security cameras and no one watching, then quickly entered each of the unlocked equipment closets and unplugged both ends of every single one of the patch cables and replugged some of them back in random ways and left the rest on the floor. I then quickly and quietly exited the closets, but before I left I turned off the electrical power breakers in each closet, and installed padlocks that I threw away the keys for, where they were previously missing on each access door. Every time I think back on what must have happened after it brings a smile to my face. I feel bad for the students that lost their internet access for a night, but I take comfort knowing that the owners of the company likely got dozens and dozens of calls. 
or woke up to dozens and dozens of angry voicemails, and while they were phone system knowledgeable, none of the cables, patch panels or switches in our complexes were ever labeled, let alone documented anywhere. They had to fix that crap all by themselves. The last one is titled, No Breaks Under Any Circumstances. My boss tried to tell me I couldn't take breaks. The company policy handbook, which I had signed and thus became a binding contract by state law, laid out lunch and or breaks based on length of shift scheduled for. When I pointed this out, she switched to scheduling me by myself and then strolling by the store to check up on me occasionally, writing me up when she caught me, having closed the store in order to take breaks, eat lunch. I called her boss, regional director, and complained, which got the write-ups removed. I literally listened to the regional director tell my boss to chill out and let me take my breaks, but she still didn't do it. Further, formal complaints resulted in no changes. I knew there was a quarterly conference call coming up so I developed the habit of walking into her office and saying, it's time for my break, and making her say, every time, that I wasn't allowed to go. She got in the habit of doing it kind of absent-mindedly in an increasingly aggressive tone. So then I did it again in the middle of the conference call and she blew a gasket, ranting at me about how many times she'd told me that I was not allowed to take breaks, under any circumstances, etc. The call, which she always put on speakerphone, went dead silent. It took her about five seconds to realize what she'd just done, and then before she could try to begin damage control, her boss politely cleared her throat and said, I've told you before that that is incorrect. I grinned a big Olay smile and went back to work, and there was a temporary manager from another store there the next day. Turns out she had had my formal written complaints intercepted before they got to her boss, which I wasn't aware was possible, apparently she had friends in high places, so I imagine that didn't go well for her. Thanks for listening.